Hey yo, what is up Thrill Seekers? Today, I am back and I'm going to be exposing Six Flags Fiesta Texas in order to show you my top six tips and tricks on how to make your next experience the cheapest, the fastest, and the best that it can be. At the end of the video, I'm even going to show you how to save up to $100 on your next trip. So stick around, let's go. Tip number one, pricing. Before you even step into the park, you need to buy a ticket. And while the website may advertise a certain cost, they keep a lot behind the curtain. This includes seasonal increases, parking costs, and processing fees. Before you pick which day to go, make sure to surf through their calendar, as Six Flags Fiesta Texas may have dramatically reduced prices during certain times of the year or certain days of the week. For example, in many of the days leading up to summer, Six Flags Fiesta Texas advertises their price at $30, when many people don't realize that this is only available on Wednesdays. So if you go on a Friday or a Monday or a Saturday, you may be paying up to $20 more without even realizing it. As you get to the end of purchasing your ticket, you are going to be hit with a processing fee of $10.99. This is a flat fee. That means no matter how many tickets you buy, it will be a $10.99 processing fee. Therefore, I highly, highly, highly recommend that if you are going with a lot of friends or a lot of family, everyone should just purchase their tickets at one time. Therefore, you save an extra about $11 per person per ticket. After that, just Venmo the person who bought the tickets or pay them back some other way. But trust me, if you have a group more than like three or four, that 1099 processing fee on each ticket is going to add up real quick. Finally, the biggest hidden expense is going to be parking. As you show up, the parking fee is an astounding $32 per vehicle for parking all day at the park. Parking, parking all day at the park. Wow, that's crazy. What many people don't realize though, is that season pass holders get free parking. And the difference between a regular ticket and a season pass most times of the year is just around $20. Therefore, if just one person in your party purchases a season pass, not only do you guys save $12 on parking, but you also get a 5% discount on all food and merchandise as you go to the park because of that season pass. So why not? And again, only one person in your party has to have a season pass in order for the entire car to have free parking. Tip number two, arrive early. As you prepare to go to the park, do not let your slow family members and friends get in your way. Really make sure to arrive around 30 minutes before the park actually opens. This is because Fiesta Texas actually opens up the entrance plaza about 30 minutes before opening. And not only that, they a lot of the times will open up two of the rides, Goliath and Boomerang. Since Goliath and Boomerang are located within this entrance plaza and their entrances are within the part of the park that they open up early, whenever we are ready to open those rides, we will open them, even if it's 15, 20, even 30 minutes before the rest of the park opens. If you go scrolling through their website, and trust me, I have, this is said basically nowhere. And one of the big reasons why is because it's not 100% guaranteed as maintenance does still have to inspect all these rides and make sure that they are safe before opening them. So cold temperatures, light staffing, or unexpected issues can kind of throw a wrench in this plan. But as someone who personally worked Boomerang, a solid 50 to 75% of the time, we were able to get Boomerang open at least 10 minutes before the rest of the park opened. So I highly, highly, highly recommend getting to the park early. Tip number three, layout. After getting to the park early and already securing your ride on two of the 11 coasters in the park, where should you go first? My number one advice is to always start with Crack Axle Canyon. This is home to Roadrunner, Iron Rattler, and the all new Dr. Diabolical's Cliffhanger. 
These three rides are some of the most popular in the park and tend to get pretty long lines throughout the day. So going there first definitely will save you hours and hours of your time. As someone who commonly takes people to the park who are a little bit scared of roller coasters, I often start off with Roadrunner Express, which is one of the more family coasters at the park. After getting comfortable with that, just go right across the street over to Dr. Diabolical's Cliffhanger, the new for 2022 attraction. While Cliffhanger may look pretty intimidating on the outside, it is actually a very smooth and graceful ride, one of the smoothest and most graceful in the park. As someone who was a lead in that area and therefore literally rode Cliffhanger three times every morning for about three or four months, I can definitely attest to the fact that it is not headache inducing, it is not nauseating, it is a very, very calm attraction, especially once you get through that first drop. As of when I'm filming this video, I literally did this strategy yesterday. So not only do I know that it helps you avoid crowds, but I also know that if you're taking someone to the park or you yourself are a little bit nervous about rides, Cliffhanger is definitely a great first major roller coaster. If you're a little bit of a daredevil like me, definitely go straight to Iron Rattler as that is the ride that gets the most crowds throughout the day though it is also probably the most intense and scary, I guess, roller coaster at the park. After Iron Rattler, if you're more of a thrill seeker, I honestly recommend going and checking out some of the other coasters before going back to Cliffhanger. And the reason why is Cliffhanger has amazing capacity and therefore, at all times of the day, the line, even if it looks long, moves very, very, very quickly. Whichever rides you just rode in Crack Axle Canyon, after that you're going to pass right by Daredevil Dive, don't ride it, and go right past the beautiful waterfalls and over to DC Universe, where you will find Joker, Carnival of Chaos, and Superman Krypton Coaster. Personally, I recommend riding Joker Carnival of Chaos first. It is not only my favorite attraction at the park actually, but it is also one that gets some of the longest lines. And therefore, getting it off the bat out of the way is definitely going to save you a lot of valuable time. After that, take a ride on Superman Krypton Coaster and go into Rockville where you will find Wonder Woman Golden Lasso Coaster, Batman the Ride, and Poltergeist which you should ride right in that order. If you are traveling with younger kids, don't worry, I didn't forget about you. Your route will be just a little bit different from the previous one that I just said. Instead of going straight whenever the park opens and going right down to Crack Axle Canyon, you're actually going to take a left and go right past Bugs Whitewater Rapids. As soon as you see kind of the castle type buildings on your right hand side, you're gonna follow that path go right under Bugs Whitewater Rapids and past that entrance of the ride and you are going to end up in the kids area of the park. The kids area is home to a whole bunch of awesome kids rides. They are actually getting a new dueling single rail kitty coaster that is going to take the place of the bumper cards over there. It's going to be super, super awesome and an awesome way to get more families to come to the park. After taking a ride on Zoom Jets, Streamliner Coaster, Up, Up and Away, and some of the other kiddie rides in the area, I recommend going basically the reverse way of the other path. So going past those waterfalls and into Crack Axle Canyon from the other side. There you can ride Roadrunner Express, which can kind of be your first step up if you have kids that are over 42 inches. If you chose to take that little step up with Roadrunner Express and your kid liked it, awesome. Go over to the back of the park, I know, kind of a detour to the other end, and go over to the boardwalk where you will find Pandemonium. In addition, don't forget to go check out the two water rides, Bugs, Whitewater Rapids, as well as Gully Washer if you are going when it's a little bit warmer out. These two rides have height requirements of only 36 inches, so they are great for any smaller kids who want to get still a little bit of a thrill as they're visiting the park. I have recommended all three of these paths to a ton of people before, and every single person that I've recommended it to has come up to me after talking about how much they've avoided the lines and how happy they are that they took my advice. So trust me, this stuff works. As you go for your re-rides or your rides on some other attractions, you may see the lines start to fill up. 
which is where you can use tip number four, single rider lines. Alrighty guys, we are halfway done, which means you only have three more tips left until I will be telling you guys how to save $100 on your next trip to the park. If you've liked the video so far, don't forget to go down below and hit that red subscribe button. Trust me, it helps out the channel a lot, and I will be posting a whole bunch of content within the next couple of months about Fiesta Texas as well as theme parks around the world. Trust me, you do not want to miss it. Even if you aren't actually a single rider, if you have a group of two or maybe even a group of three, you may still be able to ride with your party while using these lines. Just know that it is not a guarantee and that by using this line, you do understand that you may be split up from your party. The single rider lines at Fiesta Texas, while they're not a secret, not many people know about them. And a lot of the times, even if rides like Iron Rattler have an hour or even more of a wait, you can just walk right up this single rider line and get on on the first train available. These single rider lines are available on Boomerang, Dr. Diabolical's Cliffhanger, Goliath, Iron Rattler, and Roadrunner Express. Again, while there is no guarantee that you will be with your party or that this line will actually be shorter than the regular line, depending on how many seats are available for single riders, I highly, highly, highly recommend trying your best to exploit this system because I have done it before, even when I've had a big group of people. And trust me, everyone has a lot better of a time when you wait five minutes for an attraction than an hour plus. Now that you've ridden a whole bunch of attractions, thanks to that first layout at the start, as well as using these single rider lines, you're probably pretty hungry or thirsty, which calls for the tip number five, food and drinks. Food and drinks are usually one of the most costly as well as one of the most time consuming things that you're going to run into at the park. So let me tell you how to get around all of this. First off, definitely eat before you get to the park. I feel like that's pretty self-explanatory, but there's definitely a lot of people that I know who have shown up to the park, completely empty stomach, and one of the first things that they do there is eat. That is a really, really bad idea. Still though, inevitably, you will probably have to eat at some point during your day, of course, in order to stay alive. So what is the best way to do that? I always recommend mobile food ordering. If you download the Six Flags app and go into it, there is a little tab that says mobile food ordering. This is something that I literally use every single time that I go to the park if it's available. Sometimes during slower days, days that are less crowded or understaffed, they won't have mobile food ordering available. If you pull up the app and it says mobile food ordering is not available, usually that means that the park isn't crowded enough for it to really help you in the first place. So you're chilling. Again, mobile food ordering is super, super simple. You just go on the app, select the location and your pickup time, and then you can choose your food and drink option, place your order and pay online. If you go to the park, that is literally exactly what it says in the advertisement. I've been brainwashed after working there for two years. Oh no. As you go up to pick up your food, make sure to be patient. A lot of the times the culinary workers are really prioritizing the commonly long line at every single food place. And it may take a couple minutes for them to go get to you, ask you for your number and then give your food to you. But trust me, it is still going to be 10 times faster than just waiting in that line. If you have a season pass, which hopefully at least one person in your party does, thanks to my first tip, you still do get that discount on the food if you use mobile food ordering. Just go into the app, there's a little spot before you guys pay that says discounts or season pass, something like that. You can scan your season pass and get that discount as you pay over the app. If you're looking for larger portions, definitely go to Johnny Rockets. That's probably the biggest bang for your buck at the park as they give you a burger, fries, and onion rings with every order. If you're looking for something a little bit more healthy, go check out Old Blues Barbecue or Shop 6. They are both located in Crack Axle Canyon, just on opposite sides. One of them is going to be near Daredevil Dive. One of them is going to be a little bit up the path, a little bit past Roadrunner. 
Personally, I don't really go to Shop 6 or Old Blues that much just because the portions are a little bit smaller. So if you're looking for more of a bang for your buck, definitely Johnny Rockets. Looking for something healthier, Old Blues or Shop 6. Something else to note with those bigger portions from places like Johnny Rockets, you can also get larger portions from Bubba's, which is in Crack Axle Canyon, or Pete's Eats, which is in Rockville. You can share a meal. Even me, an 18-year-old guy with all of his 18-year-old guy friends, we still share meals a decent amount of time, and trust me, we are stuffed by the end. That hack of sharing meals has saved us probably hundreds of dollars all of the times that we've gone to the park, just because each meal is pretty dang expensive. Now that you got your meal, it is time for the drinks. And I'm going to be talking about the all day drink cups in this video, because I really do believe that they are worth it. The all day drink cups are about 20 ish dollars, depending on how many you buy. If you buy more of them at once, they become cheaper. Just an individual large fountain drink from the park is going to be about $5, which means if you get this all day drink cup, four refills and you are golden. If you're not really someone who drinks fountain drinks or you just wanna save some money, you can also ask just for regular water cups. Every single theme park is required to give out free water. So if you go up to any of the food stands that have those fountain drink machines, you can ask for just a free cup of water with no ice because the water is already cold. And then you can have a nice big drink of water every time you go get food. If you end up getting that all day drink cup, there are plenty of places to fill it up. Don't feel like you have to wait in a long line at one of the major food stands in order to just refill your cup. Personally, I always recommend going again to Stangerfest by Bugs Bunny and Poltergeist. It has an entire section that has multiple soda machines that you can just walk through and refill your gut. Now I know you guys are just waiting for me to tell you how to save a total of $100 on your next trip to the park. Don't worry, we just have one more tip to go and that's tip number six, what time of year to go. As many of you guys know, Six Flags Fiesta Texas has events going on all the time, from Fright Fest in the fall to Holiday in the Park in the winter, as well as Mardi Gras in the spring. In order to set up and take down the decorations for these events, as well as prepare the entertainment team for all the shows that they do, they have a little bit of a buffer time between these events, usually lasting about two weeks. If you go onto the app and into the calendar, you can see exactly when there are events going on and when there aren't events going on. If you see that there is not an event going on, a little extra tip is that usually the park hours during these times are 10.30 to 7 on Saturdays and 10.30 to 6 on Sundays. If you see all these warning signs saying that there's no event going on, that is probably your best option for a time to go. That is, of course, if you don't care about all the extra food, entertainment, and things like that during these events, and if you just want to get on the rides as quickly as possible. If you do want to go to these events, definitely go towards the beginning of the event versus the end of the event. For example, Fright Fest goes from mid-September all the way through October. I highly recommend going in September and not in October. Some other low times in terms of attendance are definitely January and February, as well as, though you may not think of it, the week leading up to Christmas. So if you want to enjoy Holiday in the Park, definitely go right before Christmas versus right after Christmas. Some other general times to avoid are definitely October, unless you're super, super into Fright Fest, as well as the weeks leading up from the beginning of spring break all the way up to summer. Spring break is understandably super, super crowded every single year, but even the weekends after spring break leading up to summer usually get pretty big attendance numbers. If you hold off a little bit though and wait until June, it'll definitely pay off because June is usually a pretty low in terms of daily attendance, causing you to wait maybe 30 to 45 minutes max on most of the major attractions versus hours the next month in July. Not only are these days a lot lower in attendance, but they are also a lot lower in cost as people just naturally pay more to go during times like spring break or Fright Fest. Alrighty guys, it is now time for me to review these tips as well as add in a couple little extra ones for the end here in order to show you how to save over $100 the next time you visit Six Flags Fiesta Texas with your friends. 
First big money saver is definitely paying for the tickets together. Assuming that you have four people in your group, that means three people do not have to pay that $11 processing fee, bringing up the first total to $33 in savings. From there, if one of you guys gets that season pass, then you just saved $12 on parking, bringing up that total to $45. And a little bit of a specialty tip here, a lot of those season passes give you specialty rate tickets, meaning that you can get one of the other tickets in your group for 50% off, meaning you have another saving of about $25. Once you get into the park, you've ridden some rides and it's time for you to eat some food. Going to a place like Johnny Rockets with those larger portions and sharing a meal, therefore getting you two meals instead of four meals will end up saving you about $30. In addition, the 5% discount from the season pass that you got way back at the beginning will give you just that a little bit of an extra savings, pushing us above the 100 mark to $103 in savings. Now moving from food to drinks, getting those four all-day drink cups all at once will save you about $2 per bottle or a saving of $8. You'll also get another $8 using that 5% discount from that season pass you got at the beginning, bringing our total up to $119 in savings. Well, that $119 number may seem a little bit high. It actually is an underestimate as that's assuming that you ate before you got to the park, that you're only gonna have one meal in the park and that you are going to eat then after you go to the park. If you end up eating multiple meals at the park, using those same tricks will save you even more money. Plus, that's not even accounting for a flash pass that you might've gotten if you didn't get there early to ride those two rides before the park opened. Go around the route that I told you guys to go on in order to avoid the crowds and using those single rider lines to avoid all of the lines at every single major attraction. And before we go, I am going to be telling you what one last tip that can also save you a whole bunch of money and time as you go to the park. But before I do that, make sure to go down below, hit that subscribe button and hit that bell because I will be posting every single week as we go into the new year. That last tip is single ride flash passes. These can cost between 10 and $20 per ride, but they are a lot less expensive than getting an all day flash pass where you'll really only use it on maybe two or three attractions. And there you go. Those are my top tips for Six Flags Fiesta Texas. Thank you guys so much for watching to the end. And I really hope that I saved you a whole bunch of time and a whole bunch of money for the next time that you go to Fiesta Texas or any local theme park. Again, if you liked this video, definitely give it a big thumbs up and subscribe. And if you have any tips of your own from when you visited, go comment down below. I would love to hear them and maybe I can feature you in my next video. Anyways, guys, for now, I will see you all next time. Peace out.